Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Genevieve Amaral. I'm the Associate Dean of the School of Humanities and Creativity in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences here at Sheridan. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon uh, for a reading and discussion with Gary Barwin, our writer in residence for 2020-2021. Uh, Sheridan College's Honors Bachelor of Creative Writing and Publishing Writer in Residence Program is an eight-month residency awarded annually to a writer who embodies the distinctiveness and the dynamism of the ampersand, the and symbol, in our program name. And we're uh, lucky this year to have Gary Barwin joining us in that capacity. Um, but before we begin, uh, I'd like to open by acknowledging that the land on which we gather has been and still is the traditional territory of several indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, the Metis, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Since time immemorial, numerous indigenous nations and indigenous peoples have lived and passed through this territory. We recognize that this territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and the Two Row Wampum Treaty which emphasize the importance of joint stewardship, peace, and respectful relationships. Sheridan College affirms it is our collective responsibility to honor and respect those who have gone before us, those who are here, and those who have yet to come. We are grateful for the opportunity to be learning, working, and living on this land. Gary Barwin, our guest today, is a writer, composer, and multidisciplinary artist and the author of more than 21 books of fiction, poetry, and books for children. His best-selling novel, Yiddish for Pirates, won the Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor and the Canadian Jewish Literary Award, uh, and was shortlisted for both the Giller and the Governor General's Award in 2016. Today, he's joining us for a reading and discussion entitled Greenberg, Goldberg, Iceberg, Using Humor to Write Fiction. Um, let me just remind you, you're all, I'm sure you all realize uh, that we're here on WebEx here today, a WebEx event. Um, most people, uh, when you signed on, would have signed on and be, and your most people are automatically muted. Um, if you are muted, please remain muted for the length of the event. Um, if you're not muted, please take a moment now and make sure that you've muted your um, audio uh, to uh, control our sound here today. Um, but however, throughout the talk, uh, we do have the uh, question, the Q&A uh, chat box uh, activated. So please feel free to type your questions as they occur to you uh, throughout the talk. Um, we'll be reading and collecting them. Um, and Gary will try to address as many as possible at the end of his remarks. Um, we'll also be recording this event. We're right now already recording this event, and it will be available with closed captioning in a few days. So without further ado, let me please uh, turn things over to Gary Barwin. Gary? Thanks so much. Um, I'm, really, um, I'm really delighted uh, to be here. Um, I'm just going to make sure my um, – here we go. Okay, sorry. Um, for making my screen and doing that online thing. I'm really, yeah, I'm really delighted. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. To, um, really, I think at these times to talk about writing and to talk about communication during these strange times, there couldn't be anything, um, anything better. And actually, maybe humor as well. It's, it is, uh, perhaps is particularly apt. I'd really like to thank everyone at, uh, at Sheridan. For, well, first of all, for having me as writer in residence. It's a real, you know, it's a delight and a real privilege. I've really um, enjoyed my um, interactions with the staff and faculty uh, so far. It's such energy and creativity um, and kindness. Um, so thank you. There's an old joke, a joke even older than the sinking of the Titanic and about as funny. It goes like this. A rabbi walks into a bar mitzvah. No, no wait, he says, I'm in the wrong joke. I'm supposed to be in a bar, not a bar mitzvah. A rabbi walks into a bar. The bartender says, we don't serve your kind here. Why not, the rabbi says. You Jews sank the Titanic. It wasn't us, it was an iceberg. Greenberg, Goldberg, iceberg, they're all the same. But if you ask Greenberg's accountant, it's not so far from the truth. What, with the pandemic, Goldberg's having a hard time keeping his head above water. And as for Greenberg, don't even get me started about his offshore investments. And iceberg, icebergs melting because of global warming. So what does that leave? History, the future, our stories. How do you make history feel present, especially a history that we already know? Or else, how do you tell of a history that seems so impossible, so beyond comprehension, beyond how we know to feel? 
a history for which normal words, normal experience, normal imagination fail us. The Holocaust, a genocide, something inexpressible, unutterable, so vast and terrible that the normal story breaks, fractures in the normal story fractures in the effort of trying to hold it. How do you make history, these stories, this reality come alive? How do you find fresh ways for history to enter our consciousness, new ways to enter our feelings? There's a risk that something vast, life itself, life that happens now or life that happened in the past, there's a risk that our thoughts will just trudge down the familiar pathways in our brain, like tracks worn into an old rug. So how do you make that imaginative journey fresh again? How do you give it the surprise and alarm, the wonder and amazement, the beauty and sorrow of a story told as if for the first time? A story told by a breathless witness just back from a war, a confession from one who was there. How do you cause not just the story, but the reader to fracture in the telling, to break apart so that they can reassemble with new awareness and knowledge? For me, as a writer, there's several ways, and I'd like to talk a little bit about them here. There's a way where you confront it head on. Maybe you tell the story with such precise and vivid description that it lifts from the page. It takes flight in the reader's imagination because it seems so true, so exactly said, like a portrait so perfectly human that it seems alive and helps us find new ways of seeing, helps us find words we didn't know for what we already knew or suspected. It's a virtual reality in words. The other way to write history involves sneak attack a geeking out of the brain, finding a secret door around the back of the head or in the beating heart. To quote Emily Dickinson, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. In other words, you make it wondrous strange. You, defam you defamiliarize it. How? You can find an unusual perspective, a surprising tone, an unexpected, na an unexpected narrator or aspect of the story, something that seems a bit absurd or ridiculous but yet ultimately is revealing. If history is fractured, you allow it to crack the story. To quote Leonard Cohen, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. A few years ago, I had a discussion with a writer whose parents and grandparents were Hungarian and Holocaust survivors. When she was little, watching Sesame Street, she told me that she always assumed the count, the one, two, three, fabulous sandwiches, ha, 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 ha that guy, because he had the same accent as her family, she assumed that he was a Holocaust survivor. That was both quite funny to me, but also very moving. But this little girl was seeing her family in this half-crazed vampire Muppet on her TV. How was his behavior, his counting, due to his having survived this unspeakable thing? I wrote something about this to explore this idea. Sesame Street's count is my grandfather, for Jennifer Glasser. What are the numbers, Count? Your Transylvanian, your Transylvanian cackle seems Yiddish to me. Your unhinged delight. Your bitter joy enumerates the world. An inventory of what's there, what hasn't been destroyed. The time I'm waiting. The time I'm waiting for those numbers in your kitschy voice, which is my parents' grandparents' voices. The counting, chanting the numbers. The Shema at the Warsaw Ghetto. The empty chairs at the Seder. Numbers on my grandfather's arm, my grandmother's, to count the future with thunder, to remember the past with lightning. I see you, Count, a survivor, the chortling paradox that there are things and that they can be counted. There's another way to address complex issues, using humor. Forget your perfect offering. There's a wise crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. It's a powerful tool that can surprise the reader. Humor relies on surprise. It relies on changing perspectives, on pulling out the well-worn rug from underneath you. It's a kind of bait and switch, a marvelous banana peel to slip on to suddenly give the reader a new way of thinking about things. What's worse than finding half a worm in your apple? A writer. Next March, I have a new novel coming out. It's called Nothing the Same, Everything Haunted, The Ballad of Mottle the Cowboy. I'd like to tell you about it, but also to talk about where it came from. 
I should say by way of a content warning before I begin that it is about the Holocaust, so some of the details are disturbing. It's Jewish history, after all. It's not all bagels and locks. It's bagels and locks, and they tried to kill us, but they weren't successful. So we created a new holiday with its own excellent nosh. First, though, a story. A few years ago, I went on a reading tour of China. I had a conversation with a Chinese interpreter about how she translates humor from Chinese, from English to Chinese. Sometimes she said, the humor is untranslatable. And so instead, when she interprets, she explains to the Chinese audience that the author has just told an untranslatable joke. And then she asks them to please laugh now in order to respectfully acknowledge that the guest author just told a funny joke. And there I thought I was killing it. Not all humor translates, but I think it's worth the risk. So some background about my new novel. One of the things my last novel, Yiddish for Pirates, touched on was the genocide of indigenous people in North America. I was really thinking a lot about this, and I wanted to explore this further and to think about how that history impacts contemporary North America and what I, as a non-indigenous person, should do about it. But I also didn't want to blunder into territory or subjectivity that I knew nothing about or to speak for indigenous voices. There's certainly plenty of astounding indigenous writers writing at the moment who I admire and revere, and they certainly don't need me to tell their stories. At the same time, I was thinking about my own family's history in the Holocaust and about intergenerational trauma. Though my grandparents left Lithuania before the war, most of the rest of the family were killed. My father told me that when he was about 14, his father, my grandfather, once came home from a bar mitzvah very upset. This was in South Africa where they'd all emigrated to. Some guy had got drunk and staggered up to him and told him that he'd seen my grandfather's parents killed by Nazis back in Lithuania before the war, I mean, back in Lithuania during the war. My other grandfather, on a cheesy wedding video that was made when I got married 33 years ago, my grandfather, who never ever spoke about the Holocaust, though he lost his parents and siblings, his whole village, turned to the camera and spoke about how Lithuanians had betrayed the Jews in doing the Nazis' dirty work. There was something about how he looked, a powerful expression of pain and sorrow that I'd never seen in his eyes before. The same grandfather, after many years of searching, had found his nephew now in Chicago. This nephew had escaped the Holocaust by walking. He was trying to walk out of Lithuania with his aunt when a Russian truck loaded with soldiers retreating from the Germans stopped. And one of the soldiers said to his aunt, we have room for one. Pass the boy up. Pass the boy up to us and we'll save him. That was the last time he saw this family until my grandfather found him in Chicago decades later. The Holocaust in Lithuania killed somewhere upwards of 95% of the Jews there, most of them being shot into trenches or other horrific means. So I was thinking about this, all of this, and a friend of mine told me about an artist, Stephen Locke, who's part Jewish, part Mohawk, and had to, who had tattooed his status number on his forearm as if a concentration camp number. That blew me away. What to do about this, this sudden connection, inevitable and horrifying, how to remember it, how to speak to it, how to think it through. I read that the Nazis explicitly adopted strategies used against indigenous people in North America as part of the design of the final solution and the co concept of Liebestrom. In 1941, when Jews were made to wear yellow stars, the Inuit in Canada were given identification tags with numbers on them. The government referred to individuals by their number. I'd also found out that Hitler, like many German speakers, Albert Schweitzer and Einstein, for instance, was fascinated by the westerns of the German novelist Karl May. He sent copies to his officers on the Eastern Front. He gave copies to members of the Hitler Youth. He had a set with them in the bunker beneath Berlin. The novels are still popular, and Europeans still role play as indigenous people. The hero of these books was Vinatu, an invented indigenous guy with an impressive copper-colored six-pack, an inscrutably courageous brow, and the marble-carved reticence, reticence of a warrior. In other words, Karl May was using the noble savage trope. Or because he's German, maybe it should be called the noble cabbage trope. This blew the top of my head off, how Nazis could be inspired by a native guy and aspire to be as brave, nature-loving, and as noble. But of course, he was a story, something made up to bind with the stereotype receptors in the Nazi brain. But how were concentration camps like reservations? What did the Germans learn from America? 
Nazis believed in a kind of manifest destiny, a pushing back of the eastern frontier to make room for Aryan Germans to live, to make living room, or Liebestrom, as they called it. And so they invaded Poland, Lithuania, and the rest of Eastern Europe, and killed and removed Jews and others, or put them into camps. It's like what happened in North America with indigenous people and the push west. And in both cases, many people were deliberately starved or died of disease. Often the Holocaust is considered a paradigmatic genocide. It has a mother, a father, a sister, and brother in indigenous genocide. A friend of mine, the Métis writer uh, Cherie Dimeline, author of The Amazing The Marrow Thieves, joked that we were genocide buddies. So all of that background is where I begin to think about the novel. This is what I've come up with so far. It's 1941 in Lithuania, and the Nazis have invaded, and the genocide of Jews has begun. My main character is a middle-aged Jewish man called Moffel, who imagines his experience through the lens of Western novels as a way of coping with the trauma of the present as well as the past. Like Don Quixote, he uses a pre-existing literary tradition to deal with his reality. He imagines he's in a Western, and he's some kind of Jewish cowboy. Like Quixote, my protagonist model decides to embark on a quest. He's going to escape. In the beginning, he has a sidekick, his nagging mother. She does something that my old undergrad landlords did. They were bakers, and during the Holocaust, they baked money into bread. So when the Nazis searched, they couldn't find it, since the outside of the bread was unbroken. A bunch of Western-like things happen to Mottel and his mother, shootouts and so on. But as the novel progresses, Mottel is going to increasingly, Mottel increasingly changes from imagining that he has a connection with cowboys to that of the indigenous people, or Indianers, as they're called in Karl May novels. These aren't real indigenous people exactly, but he begins to make some connections. This could all be very dark and serious, and so I wanted to set up the exploration of real trauma and sorrow by including humorous and satiric elements. And I wanted to play with ideas of masculinity that show up in both Western and in military stories, and with Nazis particularly. I also wanted to parody a quest narrative which leavens the horror of, which leavens the horror of the historical aspects of the novel. So what did I come up with? Well, 20 years before, my protagonist's model is involved in a shootout on the Swiss mountain. He gets his testicles accidentally shot off by Tristan Sara, the dataist. The testicles roll into a crack in a glacier and freeze. So now, in the middle of the war, model's quest is to escape into Switzerland to retrieve his testicles and use them to have a child, to create new life to counter the death that surrounds him. Will he do this? Well, you'll have to wait until the book is published to find out, but I can tell you that one of his testicles gets away. It rolls down the mountainside, turns into a huge snowball, and destroys a village. Another thing that occurs later is that Model finds himself in a camp of Polish Indianers, those cosplay Indian, indigenous people. In camp is also a Canadian Mohawk, a real indigenous person. He's a researcher from U of T, and he's there to research this Indiana phenomenon. He got stuck there with the outbreak of war. The Nazis raid the camp. They're actually looking for resistance fighters and decide to capture the non-Aryans. Of course, the real indigenous guy doesn't look what they think of as indigenous, and so the Nazis leave him, leave him alone. Only the fake dress-up Indianers in braids and feathers and loincloths look like their idea of indig indigeneity. And so a lot of them get sent to a camp. It's a grim irony, and I'm parodying the Western gaze and racist tropes of what an indigenous person looks like. How to confront the terrible reality? By creating this satiric, darkly funny scene. I did lots of historical research and wove in real stories about the Holocaust from history books and survivor testimonies, as well as riffing off Westerns and other texts, including Don Quixote. I also played with the language of Westerns and their colorful and funny expressions. We use the received language conventions and narratives of our culture to tell our stories. We also use them self-consciously to question their assumptions. Now I'd like to talk more about humor specifically and why I use it for writing about serious topics. A rabbi, a priest, and a placeholder character walk into a bar. Wait, the placeholder says. How did I get into this joke? Don't worry, said the priest. You'll get used to it. It's true, the rabbi says. And in these jokes, we always walk into a bar. But I figured something out. The bar is our lives. It's a metaphor. Oh, right, says the placeholder. Uh, of course. Then what's the punchline? Exactly, says the rabbi. That's the joke. We don't know. 
First, though, before talking about humor, I'd like to read the beginning of the novel. I love old-fashioned barbershops for many reasons, not the least of which are stories my father-in-law told me about his father, a barber on Bathurst Street. And so my novel begins in a barbershop. My protagonist is a middle-aged mama's boy, Mottle. It's July of 1941 in Vilnius. The Nazis have just invaded. Mottle, Jewish cowpoke, brisket boy, my grandfather. As usual, he was bent over the kitchen table, his mottled and hairy nose deep in the pale valley of a book, half-finished plate of herring beside his elbow, half-eaten egg bread slumped beside a Shabbos candlestick. His old mother was out shopping for food while she still could. So this model, was he a reader? If the world was ending, he would keep reading. The world was ending, he was still reading. So what was this book he had to read despite everything? One of the great westerns of the American frontier, of course, even though he knew that Hitler adored them. The master race should be brave as Indianers, the Fuhrer had said, and, set, and sent boxes of Karl May's Vinitu noble savage novels to the Eastern Front to inspire his troops. Those same manifest destiny soldiers crossing the country with orders to kill Mottel, his mother, and all the other Jews. Did Mottel intend to do something about this? Yes. He would sit at the table, his schlumpy jacket turned up at the collar, his hat like a shroud of mice, a skew on his sallow head, and read. Was Mottel a man of action? If parking his tuchus all day and all night on a chair doing nothing but reading is action, his mother would say, he's a man of action. Action, sure. Every day he gets older and more in my way. Why was he reading this Western? Because Mottle, this Litvak, this Lithuanian Jew, this inconceivable Zaidi, my grandfather, this citizen of the wild East, that brave old world of ever-present sorrow, a sorrow that had just gotten worse, had chosen the life of the cowboy. He would be that hombre who sits on his chair and imagines being calm and steady and manly, speaking only the fewest of well-chosen words, doing only what he wanted and what he must under that vast, unpatented western sky. And why not, should he say? Should my life be nothing but the minced despair and boiled hope of an aging Jew, too thin to be anything but forced made by Nazis? I choose to think of myself a pale-faced chuck line rider of the doleful countenance, a quixotic Ashkenazi of the Bronco riding the Austin Trail. Like my mother said when I told her I wanted to be a doctor. Muzzle top model, nothing is impossible when it's an illusion. He would say, what's the difference between a Jewish cowpoke and beef jerky? It's the hat. I'm feeling empty as a broken barrel. Jerky don't never feel such hollowness, at least not by the time it's jerky. But the cowboy, the cowboy keeps riding. He don't look back. Eventually, if he's lucky, he too becomes leathern and feels only what jerky feels. Mottle, citizen of Vilna, saddlebag of pain, feed bag of regret. At 45, he had a history. As a Lithuanian Jew, he was pickled in it. But though neither he nor his mother knew it at the time, something had changed. Somewhere deep down in the overworked mine shaft of his imagination, it had been determined that he would set out on a perilous adventure, this time of his own choosing. He would get up on his horse and ride. And he would have a child at his age and avoid being killed. Sometimes you have to save your own bacon when you're a Jew. The next day he went to the barbers. Even a grown man will cave in to his mother's demands that he groom if she won't make food for him. Eyes closed, a Texas reverie floating through his mind like the scent of campfire, Model lay back in the red chair and awaited his shave. But then, under a hot towel, a cowpoke can think big thoughts, but to act, he must stand up, he said. He stood up. For a moment, the towel hung from his jowls, the Santa beard of a Hebrew god, and it fell away. The barber said nothing, wet blade held between trembling fingers. The Kabbalists speak of repairing the world, healing what is broken. It's my time, he said, looking round that hair-strewn palace of strop and whisker, that little shop of Hebrews. Barber, I thank you, for I have learned much under your towel. Shave and a haircut. Did the barber, Shmuel, expect payment? Two bits. Did Model toss him these two coins before his impromptu departure? Having had neither shave nor haircut, 
He only waved, then hightailed it into the bright sun of Shnipashok, that region of Vilna whose name sounds like scissor blades. He ran through its streets, feeling open to possibility and getaway. Did Shmuel chase him with his blade? Let's say it was a close shave. And so that's how my novel begins. We humans have discovered many things, fire, language, agriculture, roller skates, war, kindness, art, and humor. Humor is one of our great technologies, and it's accompanied us on our evolution from ape to Facebook user. Certainly, other animals have humor. A chimpanzee can appreciate the classic slapstick of a fellow chimpanzee slipping on a banana peel as much as the next hedge fund manager. But I think it is only we humans who see humans who see humor as something as saying something more. Though life may be difficult, we can always take heart and watch people slipping on bananas. We may ourselves wipe out on a banana, but there's something satisfying about recognizing how in falling we partake in the human condition. Though there are others we wait though there are others we may wish would partake in the human condition more than us. Though we may despair, we can always laugh together as the powerful and self-important slide to the ground. It's hard to worry when you see how ridiculous things can be. Ultimately, humor is philosophical, metaphysical, spiritual, social. There must be a, there must be a version of the story of Adam and Eve where before they ate the forbidden fruit, one of them slipped on its peel. There's an old Jewish story that I love. A man goes to a rabbi and asks if he can explain Judaism to him while the man stood on one leg. The rabbi sends him away saying, don't insult me with your ridiculous gymnastics. Next day, the man asks the great sage, Reb Hillel, to do the same thing. Explain all of Judaism while I stand on one leg. Left or right, Hillel asks. Either, does it matter? Tell you what, you jump in the air, and while you're there, closer to God, I'll explain everything the sage says. Ready? Jump. And what does Hillel say while the man left the ground? He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's it. The man says as he returns to earth, that's it, Hillel says. The rest is commentary. That's both a joke and a revitalizing reminder. And just like the best humor, it cuts through all the commentary and pretension and ultimately anxiety-producing complexity. And it's memorable. Humor gives us distance and also an opportunity to deal with difficult things. Jewish humor in particular has a kind of optimistic pessimism or pessimistic optimism that's an integral part of the culture. There's an old saying, we laugh to keep from crying. And the Yiddish writer Shalom Aleichem, on whose story Fiddler on the Roof is based, wrote that where there is laughter, there is hope. We laugh because it gives us an alternative to despair. There's an old joke. Why don't Jews like to drink? Because it dulls the pain. Life may be difficult and there may be pain, but it is our pain. We claim our right to define our own experience on our own terms. We may not always have had land or power, money or rights, but we have always had the ability to frame our experience, to claim it as our own, perhaps to connect it with to all others who have experienced adversity in other places and other times, to look tragedy in the eye. What's worse than finding half a worm in your apple? The Holocaust. It's a terrible joke. But the point of it is that instead of being driven to despair and hopelessness, we can look it in the eye. This isn't about minimizing life's struggles, but it is about not allowing them to be in charge of our life, if only for a little while. Through humor, we're able to stand outside what's happening and look at it philosophically. Through humor, we find a way to engage, to think about what is happening and still have agency. Many times, humor addresses things we can't change. But even if, we can't, even if we can't change something, humor always gives us agency because we are the ones telling the jokes or we are the ones to whom the joke is told. That's about a very powerful position from which to address pain, anxiety, and tragedy. I think of Woody Allen's line, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Humor is a way to keep going. The narrator of Samuel Beckett's The Unnameable says, I can't go on. I'll go on. Through his own awareness of the absurdity of life and of his own absurd position in this absurd life, he finds a way to go on. I love Beckett's dark and revealing humor. In his play Endgame, a character tells this old joke. A guy needs a pair of pants and so goes to a tailor. The tailor 
the tailor tells him to come back in four days. The guy comes back four days later. So sorry, the tailor says. Come back in a week. In a week, the guy returns, but the pants are still not ready. Come back in a month. This keeps going until finally, at the end of three months, the tailor brings him in to pick up the finished pants. By this time, the guy's lost his patience. It only took God six days, six days to make the world. And you, you took three months to make me a pair of trousers. Yes, yes, but my dear sir, my dear sir, look at the world and look at my trousers. Humor not only helps us to manage our expectations and to take agency, but it also builds relationships and community. If you tell someone a joke, you're sharing a perspective. You're in this together somehow. You're seeing something together. Even if you're only imagining telling this joke, the joke to someone, you're reaching out and making a connection outside yourself. You're imagining fellowship and community. Humor can dissipate tension or enable us to re-examine power relations. This is humor's gesture function, to speak truth to power, to reveal, to open up what is hidden or not spoken about because of power, convention, tradition, or ego. Often it says what can't be said in another way. It's socially sanctioned dissent, or to use Drew Hayden Taylor's term, permitted disrespect. It allows us to see that the emperor's new clothes are all sizzle and no steak, all hat and no cowboy. And we see the naked truth, maybe in the emperor's case, too much of the naked truth. Humor is revitalizing because it allows us to see what isn't seen because of routine or convention. It calls out what we take for granted, both to critique and to appreciate. Maybe our own foibles or the foibles of our society. Humor is a tool to cause us to look at the world differently. It deconstructs assumptions and unexamined tropes. It makes strange. It makes it strange, as the Russian literary theorist Viktor Ostransky would say. Humor also humanizes. Something you can joke about seems less terrible, but also someone someone you can joke about seems less frightening or perhaps different. You know those red security locks which lock onto the steering wheel of your car the club, to protect it from thieves. My wife, Bats, who's a criminal lawyer, had a client who stole a car fitted with the club. The police began to chase him. Thing is, with the club, the guy was only able to turn the steering wheel in one direction, as Hamilton is a city of one-way streets. Uh, uh, so the police are chasing him, and all he can do is turn left and left and left again as he tries to make his getaway, but he can just spiral inwards until finally, of course, the police catch up and arrest him. Perhaps we can see some aspect of ourselves in this hapless car thief. We can relate somehow. We recognize ourselves or someone we know in that story. At the very least, the thief doesn't seem threatening or scary. I'd like to read this passage from um, the novel, a passage which isn't funny, but it did originate from a YouTube video that was funny while at the same time being moving and powerful. Maybe you've seen it. A survivor dances at the gates of Auschwitz with his daughter and his grandchildren. What are they dancing to? The song, I Will Survive. It's beautiful and moving and ridiculous too. In my book, a group of Jewish partisans are hiding in the woods in Lithuania. One of them is a young woman named Seitel. Then Seitel Stey then stood and began to speak into the forest. One day, years from now, she said, when I've lived a lifetime in America or maybe Africa, one day when I've lived for years far from here, and I've become a crone who can only dribble and hobble, totter and leak, on that day I will return with my children and my children's children. I will take them into the forest, and I will shout, Nazis, Lithuanians, you who were my neighbors and chose to murder us. I have lived many lifetimes, and yet I have returned. I have returned with my children. I have returned with my children's children. I have returned so you can see us an old grandmother with her children and their children. You are nothing now, and I have survived. And I have returned to speak to the dead also, to tell you that I have lived. I have lived to see my children and the children born to them. And all of us mourn and remember you who are buried in the soil beneath these trees. We live in your name and in the name of your children and their children who were never born. We take you with us always, for without you there can be no future. And then she sat down and took a bite of sausage and tore a piece off the bread. But here I am imagining that I'll live to the end of today or tomorrow, she said, and took a vigorous chomp on the bread. 
Here's one of my favorite poems. It's by an English professor called Martin Laba. It's called Modern Poem, and it goes like this. One, two, three, four, five, you idiot. I like it because we can empathize with, we empathize with the feeling of having read something, perhaps a modern poem, something that's so hard to understand that appears to be saying something that is willfully inaccessible or that appears uh, so entirely pointless that it seems to be deliberately trying to make you feel like an idiot. I like the poem because it's nice of the nice twist, the surprise at the end, the shock of recognition. Oh, yeah, I know poems like this, and I know that feeling. Another aspect of humor is the you can't fire me, I quit principle. When I make fun of myself, when I laugh at myself and my people, when I'm being self-deprecating, there's nothing you can say because I got there first and I've already defined myself. My father used to be president of Planned Parenthood. Once I asked him, when is a Jewish fetus considered viable? He told me it was when it graduated from either law or medical school. Once, when my kids were little, we were celebrating Passover. There are a number of foods that it is traditional to have on the table. Each of them is symbolic of the Passover story, which is about when the Jews were slaves in Egypt. And as the narrator of my novel, Yiddish for Pirate, says, you know what they say about being a slave? At least you have job security. But to return to the Passover Seder, there's salt water, which represents the tears of the enslaved Jews. There's a kind of nut and apple paste, which represents the mortar the slaves used to build the pyramids. And there are two kinds of bitter herbs used to represent the bitter life of the slaves. My kids ask me, why are there two kinds of bitter herbs? What does the second one represent? We looked it up. Why are there two kinds of bitter herbs? According to some old wise rabbis, the second bitter herbs are there so that the children will ask questions. I love this answer. It is, of course, a kind of a joke, but also points to something that, at their best, both Judaism and humor do. It causes you to ask questions. It values surprise and new ways of looking at things, like the scientific method it asks, what if and why? In Yiddish for Pirates, I have my pirate and parrot speak Yiddish. Why? Because of its inherent humor and its vitality, its ability to sum up the richness of experience and Jewish being in the world. Wherever Jews went, with or without possessions, they also brought their language. And for me, Yiddish expresses a quintessentially Jewish irony and a fatalistic yet celebratory humor. As I said, they tried to kill us, but instead we lived and created a new holiday for which we celebrate with good food and family. Life is hard, but still we're around and can tell jokes about it. Um, my novels highlight this kind of humor amidst the darkness, a tool we can use in the face of abject adversity. Finally, humor is about the pleasure of storytelling, the plot twists and delicious surprises, the opportunity to amuse and to, and to delight, to draw the reader in and lead them down the dramatic garden path. It enables the writer to confront difficult material, to give the reader a way in, and perhaps while entertaining them, rendering them open to a sneak attack of emotion or meaning. As Victor Coleman wrote of the poet, uh, wrote of the work of poet Stuart Ross, the message in the chuckle is a punch in the gut. What's the difference between tragedy and comedy? I did some research. Mel Brooks says that tragedy is when I cut my finger, comedy is when you walk into an open sewer and die. There it is, the delicious surprise of the Take No Prisoners ending. Here's another scene from the ballad of Mottle the Cowboy. Mottle lying in the dark, listening to the twitching around him, rodents, ester, trees, restlessness. Outside, the defeated exhalation of the wind. What could it do? If it lifted the killers up, it'd have to put them down somewhere. A creek, likely one branch rubbing against another. The sound, vivid as scent, twitched in his mind. A scrape of a violin, a memory. He was a small boy, and someone, was it Herschel, the neighbor, had brought a fiddle into the kitchen. Its voice was like his grandmother's, raspy and indomitable. But it rocked and swayed, whereas old Fagel's jowls were the only thing that moved unless she was cheek-pinching or sighing the pains of her ancient bones. They pushed the chairs aside, along with the Shabbos table with its white cloth and braided loaves, the silver-bright candlesticks burning low. His father began to croak his own song along with the fiddle. Ay, 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 oy, 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 he sang and rocked back and forth. He was short, short and squat, thick blacksmith arms and a white trimmed beard below his round spectacles, which glinted in candlelight. He cleaned the soot and ash and grime of the forge from his hands and arms and face and wore a, fre a fresh new apron as if he would spend his day of rest, ostentatiously demonstrating his worklessness. 
the lee, the lee, the lee, the lee, he sang with a fiddler who saw it a rolling the gun, a wordless song, or rather one to be sung with only lilting syllables, each sound meaningless in- individually, but taken together, able to carry whatever burden of joy or sorrow the singer wished. And his father reached out for his mother, sitting stolidly at the table beside her own mother. Gittle, he said, it's Shabbos. We must dance. I look like a girl, a maidala with a figure, like a sapling, maybe? You do to me, at least when there's music. Ay, ye, 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 ye. And he took her hand in his and pulled her towards him. Ijitsky and Pavlova, they were not. More like Wild Bill Hickok and Oliver Hardy. Stan Laurel and Calamity Jane. For one moment, as they torqued around the kitchen, Mottle saw what might be a smile wrestling with his mother's pursed lips. Then, oi, 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 his father reached for him, and he was dancing between his parents as if between two bears. He was giggling, and his father kissed the crown of his head, and his mother said, one day you'll have a family of your own. And Fagel, his grandmother, sighed, and the fiddler began another tune. Lily, 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 his father sang, and Mottle joined in, almost inaudibly, his thin voice cracking, a small bird being born from an egg. Which reminds me, there was this tailor, Yankala. He leaves a pair of pants to be repaired by him Schneider. At the tailor, after seven years, now covered in scars and tattoos, he returns to pick up his pants. They weren't ready. Gavalt, Yankala exclaims. It only took Adnai himself six days to make the world. You've had six years. What's to say? Now that the world is done, the tailor replies. So new, your pants are a tragedy. But at least we can talk about them. And that's the point. We can talk together about pants, about the world, about our lives. We tell our stories and the stories of those we know. We tell stories about the way the world is and the way the world could be. Sometimes we tell easy stories, sometimes difficult stories, but always with compassion, intelligence, wit, and humor. To quote Aaron, my parrot narrator, ah, it's a life, a wonder tale, and we try not to notice that, can we help it? All the time our tuchuses are plunked in the sitz bath of story. You think, gonna join enough already, but new, get plots. What can you do? You try not to let surus, your troubles, make you old. I'd like to read a final passage from my novel that's based on one of my grandfather's favorite jokes. Mottle and the woman he's escaping with. Is this a love story? Again, you'll have to read the book to find out. The sharing stories. You'll see how I retell the old joke and turn it around to reflect on the grim circumstances that they find themselves in. My grandfather used to tell this story, Esther said. You're in a train traveling from Pinsk to Minsk. A man across from you says, Oi, am I toisty? Then again, Oi, am I toisty? For hours, Oi, am I toisty? Oi, am I toisty? And again, Oi, am I toisty? You can't take it anymore. When the train stops, you jump up, burst out of the compartment, slide open the train car door, run out onto the platform, return with a tall glass of water. Here, you say, as if you'd just found Yeshua's grail itself filled to the golden brim with sacred water from a tap in the train station and would extinguish this man's holy excoriating fire. Slake your thirst, my friend. You say it is great and unrelenting. You say you suffer much. You say you suffer long. Not even when we were slaves in Egypt did you suffer so. And as for me, I suffer just hearing about it. The man takes the glass in both hands like the victory cup of a great Viking, then drinks the water in one long gulp. He smiles, his body opening up like a river fanning wide into the sea. Before long, the train begins to move, and you both settle, blessedly relieved, content, sated, back into your seats. Through the window, the land in its infinite variation passes by. Farms, trees, villages, cows, villages, trees, farms, more cows. Time passes. Five minutes. Ten. Then the man begins, an expression of exquisite sorrow on his face, a look of harrowing, soul-grieving memory in his eyes. Oi, was I toisty! Oi, was I toisty! He claps his hand against his brow, holds his other out into the unforgiving air before him. Oi, was I toisty! And what does this story mean? My grandfather would ask. Cossacks may dance and kill. Jews can quetch. Also, life is suffering. It's either now or soon or is just about to happen. And what can you do? Don't travel from Pinsk to Minsk. Go somewhere else. The world is stuffed full of other places. You'd think it would plot. 
So we'll not go from Pinsk, we'll not go to Pinsk or to Minsk. We'll go to Vilnius, Esther said. Also, Model said, these days it's best to avoid trains. Often we tell our most important or our least important stories with humor. As I said, I believe that humor is one of the great technologies, one of the great tools of humankind for investigation, for community, for keeping on, keeping on. Our stories tell us that we're in this together and together we tell our stories from beginning to our end. So in Yiddish for Pirates, my main character, Masha, had a, had a parrot. So tell me, Masha, your parrot, Alev HaShalom, may he rest in peace. Such a good imitator he was. What were his last words? My parrot's last words? What were my parrot's last words? They were, oh, I go vault. I think my parrot is having a heart attack. Thanks very much. Gary, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing uh, your work in progress uh, and your thoughts about your principle. Uh, one of the principles, at least, that that um, that animates your writing and your writing practice. Um, thanks for inviting us into your into your writing practice that way. I, I certainly appreciate it, and I know um, our audience must have as well. And thank you to everybody who has joined us um, for this time. I know that people must have some questions. We've got a couple in the uh, Q&A or the chat uh, areas. Um, please feel free to continue to add those. I mean, I imagine that most people will probably be listening quite actively. But if uh, questions have occurred to you, feel free to now uh, enter them in the, uh, as I said, in the Q&A portion and the chat portion. I think we can probably monitor both. Um, in order to um, moderate the Q&A portion, I'm going to pass it over now to Owen Percy, who is the coordinator for our creative writing um, and publishing program. Uh, take it away, Owen. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Gary, um, for your wonderful talk. Very funny, which is not a surprise, I guess, given the title. But uh, I'm super glad that you did not disappoint, which, of course, um, <laughs> we're never going to. I'm getting a, a number of different questions that are coming in through the chat function and uh, and also through the Q&A board. So I've got them in order in the order in which they've come in, and I'll read them to you unless you want to scan ahead if I'm boring you. <laughs> the first one is a kind of a combination between two two uh, questions that have come through, and one specific question and one very general question. The question basically is, what was your biggest struggle while writing this um, model uh, in dealing so in dealing with the Holocaust in particular, and how did you overcome it? So in terms of your uh, getting your head around actually writing the Holocaust, and how did you get past that? And then just a, uh, if we can sort of pull the camera back a little bit, your experiences, your career as a writer, the biggest struggle that you faced um, getting established as a writer, and how you overcame that. Hmm. No, thanks for this question. I guess. Um, in writing, well, there's two things. There's a um, huge responsibility in writing about something like the Holocaust, uh, something so that it's, it, um, it's recent. There's people who have had lived experience. There's people who have uh, or are close to people with lived experience. And so um, there's a responsibility. I mean, it, it's kind of like I'm, I'm bearing witness, but I'm also I'm very aware of bearing witness to other people's witness, right? Like I, so there's, that's, it, uh, there's a huge responsibility to, to get it right, but also to make it, to make it into vital fiction, something that's alive and that, that, as I said, speaks to the experience, as if one could ever, you know, any historical moment, as if you could narrow down, to, you know, what is the, what is a story that would, would maybe stand in for the vastness of, of what that experience is? And I would say the vastness of human experience, too. For me, also, that I'm, I'm, I was also looking um, points of connection to indigenous genocide. And so that also, in terms of, again, even more so, who am I to speak to this experience and to be very careful not to overstep what's appropriate, but yet to, I feel that it's a, in, what's my job as a writer? I'm spending, you know, several years writing this. What is, you know, what it's, it's to say something I think that is important that speaks to um, something that I think is, that needs to be spoken to. And so for me as a, I guess as an, Settler ally, you know, talk to talking to about um, and what is my responsibility as a Canadian writer, you know, and also now as a as a um, you know what is, what can I bring to the story that Elie Wiesel doesn't or or Primo Levi like what at this point and how can I locate this within um, contemporary world and and make it um, um, and and do it appropriate justice I guess. Um, one of the things I think is hard, well, 
and in terms of the other question, um, um, like it's interesting. Like, there's being a writer and there's a career as a writer. Like, I can't help writing things and I continue to write whether or not anybody is going to read those things or not. I can't, I just can't help it in terms of like, I want to engage with words to, you know, to um, engage with making things. It's just kind of the way I move through the world. It makes, makes it make sense to me. So I think that's different than a career, which means having opportunities for that writing, having work, having public, you know, publications and all of that sort of stuff. So in that sense, it's, um, not getting distracted by all that stuff. Like, you know, I want to have opportunity to get my work out so that I, people can engage with the, my words, but I also, my response, my main responsibility is to my ego or it's to, it's to, it's, um, it's to, uh, it's to the words. Right? It's to, it's, it's to, so that to, to remember that I think is, is I think the biggest challenge. Great. Uh, as a kind of a follow up to that question, we have a question from a creative writing and publishing student, Harlan Jugpal who asks, um, how did publishing your first book change things for you? How did it change um, your writing process and the way you thought about yourself as a writer? Um, and I'm interested in this question because of my own research into literary awards. Hmm. And, uh, you know, how those change the game for, for a particular writer. Yeah, you know, as soon as I published my first book, I began to grow with a radiant light and people would quietly say he's a published author as he walked by and hushed down. It was remarkable. Yeah. Um, Got free, you know, free food and drink from. No, my first pub, my first experiences of, well, I, I published um, um, chat books, so small things. So what my my really my first experience was was being part of a community. So as soon as I had a had a, a chat book, I had this thing that I could, could share, um, that I could share with the world, that I could I could be part of the discourse, I could interact with people as. Um, so to me, that was the most significant thing is being part of a our community of writers and readers. Um, I suppose that opportunity, that community got a little bit bigger and it was maybe a bit different with other kinds of books, maybe books with spines. And then I would say very significantly um, publishing a novel was also very different, not only because I was lucky enough that it was, um, I'd got some attention, but writing a novel is different. I mean, writing poems, mostly people who read them are involved in, in poetry itself. People who read novels just read because they like to read. And so that was a kind of a strange thing, but it was very touching that I was able to communicate with a broad, with many, with many more people and people I would meet on the street would say, I read your book and this is what I think, right? That was a very touching thing to think of being able to speak to um, a broader range of people. So I, um, but so I continue to, to, for me, I continue to write, I'm writing novels, but I also write weird experimental things that like six people are interested in, but I value those six people, right? That we have as a particular kind of intense interest in certain kinds of things. And so I write many different kinds of things for many different communities of readership, I guess. Um, um, doesn't ever get noticed by that. Um, it's just a certain kind of work that gets um, noticed. And so I'm grateful for that opportunity, but I don't forget all the work that isn't going to um, get that kind of recognition. Great. Um, I have a question about uh, the technology of humor. I've got a couple of questions lined up here, actually. But the first one that came in was uh, one about satire in particular okay. and uh, the rules around satire, whether they're <laughs> written rules or unwritten rules. So the question is, uh, what are some rules of satire that you recommend to writers who might be just starting out, mm -hmm. um, sort of dipping their toe in the, uh, in the yeah, satire yeah. pool? And... Um, yeah, I don't know about, I don't know, I'm not sure about rules, but it's kind of a, a, a feeling. I mean, I think that um, being First of all, being careful who you're satirizing and what you're satirizing. I think that to, um, you know, satirizing those people who you might feel deserve to be satirized and to be, to be, um, um, you know, um, knocked off their throne. But so I'm going to feel punching up, not down, I think. Um, and also, I think that it's easy to be satirical without, um, uh, a recognition of the depth and complexity of humanity. I think so. The thing is, you can do that with satire as well, not just um, so, not just making fun of something, but also recognizing um, 
the complexity of being human, it doesn't mean that you have to say, making fun of Nazis and you have to recognize their humanness, but you are recognizing that we're all, in the broad sense, part of a human endeavor, and we all have complexities and, and um, 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 uh, um, contradictions and paradoxes, I think. And so that's, it, it, it's a tool of, for broadening out rather than just for like making smaller, I guess. So I guess, as always, I think writing is about making things broader rather than than making something smaller, even with even with satire that is, is deliberately toppling of, of protection. Great. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead a couple of questions, and I will get to the other ones that were asked, but this one that seems obviously uh, right in the same vein. Uh, the comment came in to the host uh, who sent, sent it to me. I love the idea of humor as a technology. To extend the metaphor, I guess all technologies can be abused or at least misused. <laughs> what for you does the abuse of humor technology look like? Well, I mean, I think it is. I mean, it's a good follow up because it is, as I said, it is something that makes things smaller, that narrows the view rather than it broadens it. I mean, I, it's a great to me. It's a great tool for unpacking, like all writing is. You for unpacking, for examining, for for opening up a discussion, for looking into something and seeing more aspects of it. I mean, to me, that is the one of the roles, the important roles of writing. So I feel that that is that is you know. Abuse of humor would be making something smaller and making it closed off, and then it's like, yeah, we know what you think, and that's it's a binary. It's like me good, you know, I'm good. This is bad, right? And that's it. As opposed to, you know, a broader a broader look. I guess. I mean, I think you always have to bring your, even if it doesn't show up directly in the surface of the writing, you bring your your largest humanity your to to the, to the to writing, you know, and and. Um, and so that, and so, and I think that's what we should, you know, aspire to do, even if it's some highly conceptual piece of work that um, maybe has a sleek surface that doesn't seem, you know, to penetrate into humanity. It still is, that's still implied in the whole engagement with it, I think. Great. Thank you. I'm going to uh, follow up with a, a craft question, I guess, and then we'll, and then move to a creativity question in general. So this is a question that came in in the Q&A from Hillary Richards Campbell, and uh, there's a couple of different versions of it, but from what I can glean, it says, thank you for speaking to us today. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I once read a piece of advice about editing, I think, from Robertson Davies, but I can no longer find the passage. He advised when something isn't working to find your favorite sentences and strike them out. This is pressing yeah. to those who teach creative writing and urge our students to kill their darlings. Right. As I recall, the idea is that sometimes the finest bits of writing simply don't fit into the story that you're trying to tell, but your love of those pieces is what's stopping you from moving forward. Okay. Let yeah. them go. Do you find that this is true in your own editing process? Uh, are there some great sentences or jokes that haven't made it into your work yet? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm always of two minds about that killing your darlings. I mean, sometimes my advice is, no, 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 then, like, nurture your darlings like go for it like get rid of all the other stuff and like what is it that's going to, i mean if it's just driven by i'm so smart i'm so great here it is and so it's not about the actual work it's about your own feelings about it um so i mean it has to be the work i mean there are times i remember sitting in a coffee shop a couple of years ago taking out something that i remember sitting in the same coffee shop spending like two days some super clever bit of you know puffery that i was trying to um shoehorn into the novel and it it wasn't the right thing, and it was just me thinking I was so clever and try and and so it wasn't. It was a it was a darling, or it was I was the darling, not the writing. So it's, I don't want to be the darling. I want the writing to be the darling. And so to be able to, um, if like not to be hung up on well, two things: not to be hung up on particular passages if you just love them, but they're not appropriate. And so certainly I've taken those things out. Then there's also a really lovely piece of advice by James Tate, the American poet, which something to the effect of. Like, you don't, every single idea you have, you don't have to hold, like, it's a precious little bird. You'll have other ideas. You're, the whole point is you're an endless stream of ideas. It's not like, okay, that's the one thing that you get, you get, you, you know, in this life, you get, like, a limited number of ideas. If you can come up with ideas, you can come up with more ideas. Um, it's, a whole, it's, it's a process. It's not a product. I mean, of course, some, you have, sometimes you have a great idea, but, um, but so rather than think, if you take it out, it's okay, because you can also, um, uh, you, you'll come up with some, something else. It'll, you know, whatever. I do have, I found it hard to get rid of some of the things I really loved in, in, in editing novels. So sometimes, not in just erasing them, I have an older version of the file. They would be there anyway. I would take them out and put them in another file 
just so I felt like I was looking after them because I couldn't bear to just erase them from the as if it was racing. And if somebody ever says, hey, Gary, do you have some overwrought, ridiculously purple, you know, trying too hard pros that we could use? Why, yes, I do. I have a whole file of it. Here it is. So, I mean, it's part of writing is also tricking yourself and being able to help yourself not feel too, you know, um, despondent when you have to do those things. But you have to ultimately trust the writing and, you know, over your own feelings, like over your own ego feelings, not your own into in, in, deeper intuition as a writer. That I think you should trust very much. Fantastic. Um, I've got, uh, speaking of feeling despondent <laughs> and speaking of being uh, a fountain of creativity and the, the idea that you're going to have other ideas, this is the, the be all and end all. We have a question more broadly about creativity um, that came into the chat. Do you have any advice for people who are finding creativity and inspiration particularly hard right now because of the pandemic? The global pandemic that we're all enduring. Uh, I advise running into the street, scraping with your hands on your head. Uh, I think is always always good. Several times a day, you get fresh air. Anyway, no, we're I think masks or not unmasked. <laughs> yeah. it's good. It's, well, it's good to be masked because when you run into people and knock them over while you're doing it, it's, it's, good, it's, it's helpful. It's cathartic. Um, I, you know, honestly, I think so much. Well. It's always self-compassion, but also I think that people think that, I mean, I think it's too, or it's too easy to think that you're supposed to write a certain way and the work that you're supposed to do is a certain, as opposed to just trusting what interests you at the moment. And sometimes that, to me, is the most, that's the best way to go and often the most revealing. So if you, okay, you can't write the great novel that expresses the, you know, the complexity of our time at the moment, but maybe you can write some little thing that just, it's like a little, it's like little kindling. It's just some little brief little moment that just addresses something that puts you back into your body, into your creativity, into your moment. Maybe it's a, just a small little little squib about something. And I think that's okay. Like I think that we often start out as if everything we have to do is, should be able to be carved in granite, but maybe not. Sometimes things are just good to just exist for just the moment, or they're just a small little small little. Uh, I, statement for the universe. I think to me that, and then just to trust that, and I think that means that um, it, and it uh, enables you to, to, to feel, to trust your own kind of creativity, however it looks like in the midst of these, of, the, of these times, you know, or if it, if it, you realize it's just too much, don't put the, I mean, it should, it's not to do it. If it put the pressure on, take the time to, um, you know, um, uh, re, um, rejuvenate. And self care, you know, whatever that looks for me, self care looks like making up stuff, yeah. but for sure. it doesn't. So, do you think that um, finding the skills that we have for finding or accessing creativity and inspiration, do you think that they're transferable? Do you think that it's a sort of innate thing that, uh, you know, comes to you as a creative person or a writer? Is it something that you cultivate? You mean, so are you born being creative? Is that kind of, well, that I'm not sure, but I do know that there's an awful lot of, of what expectations, societal expectations that I think t like teaches us not to be or teaches us to expect creativity is going to look like a certain thing. And part of it is to find our own natural way of in, in creatively engaging with the world. I do think that humans in general are creative and creative species uh, for good or ill. Um, and kids are creative um, and we so much of acquiring the skills to be an adult and to be and being educated narrows down what creative creativity looks like. Maybe you think you have to write a novel that's long, ruminative sentences that are all in, but that may not be you, and that would you can't write like that, and that would shut you down. As opposed to finding something that's more that's more exciting to you, like what genuinely excites you, what genuinely inspires you to be creative. To me, is what one should do, and it's so so much of that is is taught um, is taught out of us. For, um, so because of fear of taking risks, for fear of doing it wrong, for hope to, to, that the work will be a certain way, but you have to be like, you have to be who you are as a creative person. I do think you can certainly learn. Um, it's not that creativity can. I think um, there there are ways to bring that out. So you can, in that sense, you can learn creativity by le by by have, giving many techniques. Uh, learning, having some technical things that maybe the things to bounce against and inspire you, but also that help you come go back to yourself, go back to your innate creativity, because it's always you engaging with something 
in a creative way. And so if you feel empowered to engage creatively, and if you have a knowledge of something that is interesting to engage with for you, like, oh, I can write stuff like that. Cool. Okay. That makes me want to make up. Then, then, you, then I think that leads you back to creativity. I do really think that um, ed creativity education is absolutely something that can, can be taught. And it's, you're not, you know, and people are born in diff with different strengths and weaknesses. That's true. But I do think that we can bring everybody to their, you know, innermost creative self, whatever that happens to look like. So do you think that if it can be taught, do you think that it can be forced? And what I mean by that is, <laughs> one of these, are you one of these uh, writers who is always raring to go and sit down at your desk every morning? And you're just so excited to wake up and, and get back to the work, thing that you're working on? Or are you somebody who says, I know that I need to get to this next part and that I, it's, not, I, it's not coming together for me, but I'm going to sit down at the keyboard and hammer it out? Um. Yes. So sometimes, sometimes it's okay. I have, I want to interact. I want to make up stuff, but sometimes I have to say, okay, there's all these other things I want to do, but now I know there's this thing that maybe not immediately occurs to, so often I just start out just making up something about something not according, like I'm cheating and procrastinating and I sneak off and I write a poem or I do a, write some music or I do something different. But, and so there is a kind of focus and self discipline to turn my attention to, um, working on on a larger project that maybe I would find difficult because it's it's hard it 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 once I've the kind of the the uh, uh flush of you know first imaginings is is gone i have it's sometimes I have to push myself and naturally I want to do the stuff that just comes more easily, which is you know which I like to do and i still I still do that but I find that like kind of not forcing it but by kind of engaging with um the kind of task at hand, it sometimes draws out less obvious things for me. And so that process of um, pushing through something, I have no ideas, but let me see if, see what, if I, um, if I attend to it, something sort of kind of it draws me out. And I like that, I've enjoyed that experience of writing novels where I've done all, used all the shtick that I know after 50 pages, now I have to really come up with something different. And then it's, I'm, I'm happy to find out that that process itself is enriching because I have to as they say, dig deeper, but I mean, it's just, I have to be more inventive and, and, um, and I can't rely on, on some things that I, I know. And so I really like that, I like that experience. Um, but on the other hand, if it's just not happening, then I'm also happy to use the energy of that to make up something else. So I'm always working on multiple things at once. Great. And, uh, this is a question, uh, another question from a creative writing and publishing student, Adriana. Uh, who asks uh, about, uh, again, the pandemic, has that been happening to you? What about the pandemic so far has influenced or changed your work itself or your working processes? Um, it's really sad that really I wasn't going any place and I had, you know, and I was just going to sit at home at my desk anyway. So, you know, it's, um, you know, I guess I've been thinking about I and mean, then having conversations with people about kind of basic communication. Like, I mean, it, it sounds... It sounds, you know, Pollyanna, it sounds a bit simple, but just talking to people, just sharing things, just connecting and thinking about what's essential. That somehow seems, because I guess with all the distractions, all the hubbub of, all, of jumping around, going out and we're doing all the things that, you know, the um, social expectations, just kind of focusing in on some of those things about communication, about sitting with my own feelings and how I'm feeling and how other people are feeling, kind of more intently in tune on, on that. Um, I think because I'm not rushing about as much. And so, I mean, even in terms of thinking about how society works, okay, what are, what are the things that we want to start back up again and what things mm, we just did because we did them, right? Um, so there's a, that kind of an intensity and a kind of um, some simple things, like I feel like in a way, I feel like it's one of those kind of poets like, oh, look, um, the leaves are beautiful. <laughs> how great, how nice it is to stand outside and feel the breeze on my face, but it is. <laughs> And it just, that some of that stuff has, you know, become just that much more apparent to me because we have feeling of restriction and not um, able to go out into the world or not able to communicate with people. You're stopping to smell the roses, but <laughs> if you can smell them, it means that your N95 mask is not working. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Great. So that wraps up the questions that have come in so far. Uh, I'll give folks a second or two to fire off a, a, a last minute question if they've got one that occurs to them. I'll take this time to again say thank you very much, Gary. We really appreciate it.
and uh, enjoyed your talk very much. And to remind everybody who's watching there that uh, we've got a few more creative writing and publishing events. Um, and uh, we are going to uh, be advertising those relatively soon. The, the one that's uh, locked down that's, I think, very exciting one is Kai Kella on November 25th. We do have another question that just came in, came into the host. A couple of questions. Great. So this is the question. I've had this question come up recently with one of the longer personal pieces I've written by somebody else who's also writing their own story. That is, how do you know when it's appropriate to put a put a content or trigger warning in a work? Because I notice most published novels don't have any sort of warning about the content. Yeah, Are there books yeah. that come to mind that you think deserve a trigger warning or would you recommend putting a trigger warning in? Also, do you think that every writer should put uh, creative writing in their novels that have some sensitive content? Um, I, I sort of feel when we're, when we're born, we should always say, okay, here's a trigger warning for all of life. Just go forth and be ready, because who knows? Um, and I actually think that's kind of the case with novels. In, certainly in the context of a class or a particular reading where you're in a moment, just, you know, you're in that space. But, you know, I feel that, um, you know, that you would expect reading work that you might encounter, you know, that's, a, you, there's, all, there's all sort of the paratextual stuff around it. You know what it's about. It says it in Jack. So it's like, okay, I can't deal with subject, that kind of subject matter. But I feel that that's part of what um, writing it, it dealt, deals with difficult things that it mean, tr like it's triggering. I mean, meaning that it, it, it opens you up to sensitive um, engagement with your own feelings and, and your own experiences. Um, and hopefully you can read in a place where you can, if you need to put it down and, and regroup or, or, or get help or whatever, whatever you need, like, it, or hurl the book out the window if necessary, you know, I think, um, but I don't think that we should, um, you know, like for children, we put bumpers around sharp objects, but for, I would, I would think for adults are ready to engage with the reality of the world. And I mean, I always find it sort of strange in the news. They say some of these things might be disturbing. Well, it's the news. Like, what do you think you're listening to? Like I, you know, if it was the friendly giant or a kids, you know, a kid show, then okay, that's, that makes sense. Um, so I guess I, I don't feel that I do absolutely in a context, in a reading, in a class, oh, that's a different, that's a different thing. But I assume that that just goes with the territory that you, you know, it's not just anodyne. It's, it, it should, you know, um, I know there is a, I, I would say that there is a pressure to, not, I'm sorry, not all work has to be difficult. There's also work that just creates happy, simple joy. And it does not, and there is a pressure to, I think, in this current writing moment to reveal and to deal with dark, diff, difficult, personal things. And that, you know, it's appropriate to tell stories that have not been told before or that are important to tell. But it doesn't mean that you, that any writer needs to do that or should feel that they like they're not being a proper writer if they don't they don't reveal all these you know difficult things or engage with it. I mean, you have a choice as to how to engage with those things or not. Um, and so there's so many other ways of, of things that writing can do, um, even memoir that can can do. I mean, maybe sometimes it's almost like sometimes it's the things that you don't say are the most powerful. There's a really beautiful novel called The Summer Book by uh, uh, Tova Jansen, who wrote the Moomin the Moomin Troll um, books. It's an adult novel, and in the very beginning of the novel, the mother, um, or we know that the mother has died, and the little girl goes to stay with her grandmother on an island, and they never mention the loss of the mother. But it's this beautiful, touching moment between the mother and the, and it's just there. And it's so infused with that depth of that experience that it doesn't actually have to go into all of the brutal facts of it. You know, and so different people, some people who haven't had deep grief may just read it as this lovely um summer with the grandmother and the daughter and people who have experienced grief would be feeling that sort of phantom pain off, you know, off the island, I think. So I, I really okay. feel that you can choose what. Great. What it is. I just want to follow up because I realized I misread the CW as creative writing because I'm a CWP guy. Oh, uh, okay. I think it was referring to content warning. So the, the second part of that question was, do you think every writer should put a content warning in their novels that have sensitive content? Yeah, you know, it's incumbent on the writers to do that, or the editors, or the publishers, or no, I don't. I I, I guess I said like I really don't think so. I think that we have to um, because it's a choice for part of the content warning thing is you're in a space and you should be ready. But I think with the book, you should you can kind of you choose to, how to engage and how it's going to connect with you. I mean, hopefully the 
the, the information around it will tell you whether or not this is going to be something challenging to you. But um, the world is complicated and dark, and we have stuff to deal with. And I think that, and without trivializing, I mean, you know, people, because they have their own way of addressing their own pains and, and difficulties, and they have, I mean, the book is great because you can put it down, you can read it one page at a time, or you can read it the whole thing in once. But you, you, you have agency with how you respond to it. You can read a couple lines and then sit down and take deep breaths or weep or go back to it or laugh or whatever. You can, you know, um, or you can write a very angry letter to the publisher and writer expressing how that, you know. So, I mean, I think that, I think it is about, you, you, you always have the, agency within within dealing with a book and I don't think that um, I don't think that we should that we need to warn people off okay well maybe I'll offer a trigger warning about this question because this question is a specific question to you having to do with precisely that kind of thing since you're a proper writer as you just said <laughs> which is to say to be able to tackle such traumatic history particularly the history that has been a lived experience for your family did you find that humor was necessary for yourself to distance yourself from the narrative did the narrative cause you to relive the experience or has it been an outlet of expression and comfort um so what I, what I, what i would say was um cuz i'm i'm more i would in truth, I was more thinking about my family's experience, not my own personal, but I certainly have felt the pain, like my grandfather, for instance, I, I, I certainly was aware of the kind of pain that he felt. I, I did a lot of research and it was very overwhelming to read, you know, the things that I knew a little bit about, but to really read deep survivor testimonies. And I mean, absolutely, it, it was extremely difficult. Um, yeah, I mean, as a, my response both is to, Try and articulate it and 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 um, um, write beautifully about it so that it, it that, that itself is consoling and to give it dignity and, and respect and to kind of feel like I'm giving good witness to what I what, what people have spoken about. But also, yeah, immediately to also make to joke about it and to and to all the things I was saying in my talk about how ways of grappling with using humor to take it apart to show the ridiculous puffery of it or the absurdity of it or the, you know, to me, I guess the creativity in the response of, of incredible things, um, of, of, of painful, difficult things, both in terms of sometimes it's funny, sometimes the kind of awe-inspiring creativity that people managed to make through. There was a story of a, there was a, a famous poet, uh, um, Abram Sukhaver, who um, talked about escaping um, across a minefield by, by, he had to get across the minefield. He didn't know where the mines were. So he, um, stepped to the rhythm of a poem uh, that was a song. And that's, he just said, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do. The only way I know how to do this is to step in this rhythm. And hopefully I'll just trust myself to this rhythm because who, how can one make a choice in such insanity? And he made it across. Like, I mean, that, it's sort of, it's that kind of chutzpah, that kind of, that kind of, um, Finding your own way through is sort of like I feel like what humor allows you to do, and I certainly had to do that too because it was so shockingly awful the kinds of things that we humans do. Great. So this uh, there's a question that has come in from Bonnie Landrum. People are really firing the questions off now. <laughs> they realize they've only got a couple of minutes left. Bonnie Landrum asks, "Is humor your first response, or is it part of a layering subsequent draft? So when you're mm -hmm. writing something down, you realize there's a story to be told there." Is it funny from the get go, or do you write down what you want to say and then funny it up? Yeah, in, in drafts. I, yeah, I have my uh, Microsoft funny filter. I can put on. Um, I mean, of course, in drafts, sometimes I change. You know, I I edit the tone, make something more. You know, I I I, I create nuance. But I would say I it becomes for me. It feels like really implicitly part of the of the way of conceiving of some of something. Um, I'm, I mean, my characters, and also I would say that um, the first thing I have to do to be able to even confront it is to think about my characters and the and the narrator sensibility, and that that's the kind of vehicle through which I go through the world of the novel. So it's not like I okay, here are the facts. Now I need to yeah, now I need to you know add add the things. <laughs> It's like I remember somebody keep telling me we had a music student said, okay, I learned all the notes and now I'll learn all the sharps and flats the next week. Like I'm gonna, you know, like I, so it's it's implicitly part of of 
how I think of, of the material, and it's through the through the voice of the of the narrator and, and the characters. That's the world that I'm I'm in. Um, it's not like I you know I make it in black and white and then I'm going to add the color, or I make it as you know um, as a documentary and then I think it's fiction. So it's to me that that's part of how it unfolds as a novel, as opposed to me just recounting the facts of what I've assembled. That's a great question. Great. Here's another good question from uh, Vice Provost Yale Katz. She says, amazing, Gary, thank you. Could you comment on language as the fabric of our thinking and how in the context of your writing and thinking, you negotiate the shift between languages and cultures, English, Yiddish, Hebrew, to mm -hmm. better capture uh, every moment or each moment? No, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I really thought a lot about that with Yiddish for Pirates, which is why that I, I used a lot of actual Yiddish. Um, there was a line in, in um, that I quote, an old Jewish proverb that says, the tongue is not in exile, meaning, so even if you leave, um, if, even if you're exiled, you always bring your language with you. You bring your sensibility and the traditions and the textures and the, the way of seeing the world. It's in, in your language. Um, so for this novel model, the cowboy one, I didn't, I didn't use Yiddish or hardly at all, but I tried to capture a sensibility of those characters sort of um, the kind of way of thinking through through language. And in this case, he, in a way, he uses cowboy language as a way of my model, as a way of mediating the world. He finds that as a frame and then starts interrogating that frame and realizing that he has to forge his own sort of syncretic way through the world with his own, own his, his own, all the things he knows about culture and how that comes in his own particular way of, of speaking of the world and of he, listening to the world. So I feel that that's what I have to do is to find the, the right timbre, the right tone, the right. It's like, okay, I have a melody. Here's a melody. What would be the best instruments to set this? Is this a, is this a French horn melody? Is this a, a, like a distortion, distortion electric guitar melody? Is it something I'm supposed to scream my guts out? Or do I kind of whisper, you know, whisper quietly? And so what I, and that, that becomes a melody then, right? The melody isn't apart from that. Right? It's just, it's implicitly part of that and of what that, um, carries like language language carries the voice carries um, all of that it's epistemological it carries that knowledge of the world of the sensibility so that's for me that's I I'm somebody who revises a lot as I'm writing because from one word to the next if that word is different then the world is different so I need to I need to construct I need to construct it from the beginning so I know what the world looks like not just um, come back and make the world, like make the language after the world. The world is the language when I'm writing. Great. I think this will be our last question. And uh, it's an easy one. It's a softball. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, this is one of these questions. This is a, sh a shared in question for you, which is that it just says, Gary, can you define creativity for us? <laughs> Am I allowed to say no? Um, Oh, okay. Ah. Yeah, that's really interesting, right? Like, and it's funny that it's something that becomes separate from like creativity as if it's a separate thing. Um, because it's so, to me, it's like we move from one, we move from one thing to the next. We have a choice of like, okay, from here, like, you know, from one place to the next, I think it's, we have a choice of where we're going to, where we're going to go. And to me, that's what creativity is, is choosing, um, Knowing that there's options, you can go this way or you can go that way. I can, you know, from this word to the next word, or from um, this molecule to the next molecule, or this room to the next room. I can choose where to go, and so just be aware that there's possibilities, and then maybe make those choices with an awareness of the possibility. Like even if you go where you might ex expect it to, it's a sense of have, but knowing that you didn't have to go there, you could have gone to all these other places. So for me, that's creativity, and it means that your world is always larger and has more choices in it, even if you um, choose to do the expected, you still are in this vaster world that you have this vision of, of choices around you. And to me, that is creativity, just that knowledge of the possible and that you could choose the possible and, it, the, and the possible is vast. How's that? <laughs> Pretty good, Gary, for being put on the spot. Thank you. So I'll take this uh, moment again to thank you. And uh, to thank everybody for joining us today. And if you have questions still that you'd like, Gary, to, to think about, you can fire them into the Q&A and uh, we can handle them afterwards if, that, if that's something. But um, 
I will remind everybody that there'll be more creative writing and publishing events coming up, specifically November 25th with Griffin Prize winner Kai Kella. And uh, you'll be hearing about that uh, from us through the usual channels relatively soon. So thank you very much, Gary. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody out there for uh, joining us today. Hope you got uh, the, the tremendous enjoyment that I got out of it um, as well. So thanks a lot, folks. Have a good afternoon and have a good uh, rest of the week. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.